go up there Tuesday to see him. If anybody would like to go with me, you're more than welcome to get with me after church. Uh, but they got the tube out of his throat. He's awake. He's not paralyzed. He can talk. And uh, he knows he's got a long road ahead of him. But uh, God has been so good to him. And uh, like I said, uh, I'm going to a place where the soul never dies.
almost to the 16th chapter of Exodus. But before we start, I'd like to make a comment. Last week, last week, I think he preached. Preached good. Preached about the man coming to the Lord and said, Lord, people can come here. And afterwards, I've done the job. Afterwards, the apostles come to the Lord and said, why couldn't we do it? Why? He said, this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. Now, it's not my job to run around and check on you to see how much you pray. But the fact is, probably most of us don't pray enough. <coughs> Many people probably virtually never go in their closet, their back bedroom, all by themselves, get down on their knees, and begin to call out on God and that's just it. And I don't know, I'm no great authority, but I actually wonder how many people believe in fasting. You rarely hear it said much about it. You rarely hear it realize. Now, I don't believe in fasting coming to church with your head in your hands and telling people how you've suffered this week because you fasted. You can fast to keep it between you and God. But, we will not accomplish these things without doing some praying and some fasting. I not pray or fast, just pray and fast. It's, these are our requirements. It's not a church requirement. It, it, it ain't nothing. It ain't the Pentecostals, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Lutherans, the Methodists. It's what the Lord said. This kind come up now on the prayer and fasting. So, if you'd like to see something about David was talking about, check out your prayer and your fasting. See how they're doing. Uh, the sixth chapter of Matthew said, "You fast, be not as the hypocrites." You know, the Pharisees when they fasted, they get on the street corner, and I understand they would kind of mark their face up, and they would stand there showing you how they were suffering. They wanted your glory. But you fast, wash your face, and wash your hands, yep. so that you don't appear to men to fast, but unto the call. Yep. And if you want to see these things done, you're going to have to pray and fast. Now, the boys preached the other night something real good about just one man. Well, that's not the whole story. We're going to read about Moses here. We'll get into the 17th chapter of Exodus. Moses was the man that God had called, and God had told him to do all these wonderful things, but we're going to get over into the battle. But Moses had to have him. He stood on, he held his he was in war with the Amalekites, and he held his hands up for as long as he did. They won. After all, his arm got so tired he couldn't hold them up and dropped them down. So, two of the brethren took him and set him on a rock and they got on each side of him and held his hands up. <coughs> you want to see this work go, you're going to have to help hold up the hands. You just, there's no one man going to build a church totally by himself. You must have some help and support from some of the people in the church. In the 16th chapter of Exodus, we see where the Lord has laid out the manna. And he said, you get up out each morning, you get enough for that day and that day only. <laughs> now, they had a hard time listening to what the Lord told them to say. They got more than they needed that day. And they stored it up. And it spoiled them on that night. Had worms in it and stuff for the next morning. You see, I think here's the key to this. 
They did not obey what the Lord told them to do. And this is my problem a lot of times. I know what to do, but I decide I don't want to do it. And, and this, if they ain't careful, this is our problem. Believe and obey. It's all God has ever required out of any people. We told them. So, when it comes, even for the Sabbath, he says, gather enough for two days. But it didn't work. Because they were in obedience to the command of God. That was the difference. They obeyed the Lord. Well, we go on down and uh, we get down to the 17th chapter of Genesis, um, Exodus. And the congregation of the children of Israel <coughs> won from the wilderness of sin, and from after their journey according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in pronounced the word and there was no water for the people to drink again there was no water so what the people do remember all God has done for these folks in Egypt remember all the miracles you see remember walking across the water and dry land so there ain't no water is what they said to me they were defeated you just brought us out here to die of thirst all you know. Immediately was This is the thing about it. We faith. It says we need faith. Oh, the steward, I think his name is Chris. Chris about the power of expectation. Faith. Believe in what God has promised us. This is scripture. First Corinthians, the thirteenth verse. God will not suffer us to be able to bear it, but with the temptation, He will make a way to escape. We oftentimes excuse ourselves for doing that that we know we shouldn't do, but it's unexcusable because in all circumstances, when we get faced when it comes to our ability, God will provide the assistance. And otherwise, none of us would make it. So now here it is, they said, um, there's no water to drink. Well, for the people did chat with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chat you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? Can God do this? They can't do God. Now, here is the temptation. Can God do this? We, 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 we want water to drink. See, they should have believed God would provide. Because God had said to go to Canaan. Remember, several times I've heard Stevie preach about the bottom of the boat and Jesus been there asleep. He'd already told them, so let's go to the other side. So he went back to the boat tower. He was a human being. <clears throat> he laid down on sleep. Had they really a completely believed what he said, there would have been no reason to wake him up. Because he already said, let's go to the other side. Abraham. God told him to take his son up on the mountain, the only son, and sacrifice him. <coughs> okay, Lord. In order for him to do that. Now, there is also this with it. God had already previously promised Abraham that through Isaac would be a great blessing to all peoples. <coughs> through Isaac would his descendants be counted. Abraham believed God. So therefore, he could take his son up on the mountain and sacrifice him. It's important to note that he didn't know how God was going to fix it, but he knew he was going to fix it. So that's the thing we need to do. In this day and time, the last 200 years, American Christians have been pretty well done along. Pretty much you can go about doing what you 
want to be mad, we should be mad. If you want to be Pentecostal, you be Pentecostal. We want to be Methodist, you should be Methodist. You can be whatever you want it to be, and people might disagree with you, and they might say a little something against you, but the fact was, pretty much, they left you alone. But now this is changing. They even got to come out now. The Christian religion is persecuted in more countries than any other religion. Virtually all communist, all Muslim, India, Africa, they persecute Christians. In some cases, they are actually killing them now. They're beating them. They are treating them horrible. We need to believe God will deliver us. Irregardless of what happens, we need to believe God will give us a way for him to go. They may take our lives, but we need to understand that even though we die, we'll live with Christ. Otherwise, when we see, we'll be like the Israelites. We ain't got no water. We're going to thirst. We're going to die. They did not believe God. And this is something we need today. When we face persecution, when we face it, and the laws are changing in America, they are changing. And as they change, rather than be defeated, we shouldn't be like Abraham when the Lord said, Get your son and take him upon the line. We say, I'm going on. I'm going on. Because I'm going to stay with God. Because in the end, God's going to do what He's promised. Now then, I didn't know what that meant. I Googled it last night. It means to. And the people thirsted for water, and the people lumbered and disposed, and said, Before for is this, thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst. And yet Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? For they be almost ready to stone Lord. Look how their mind changed. Look at it. The joy of shout after they crossed the Red Sea. How great God was this after they crossed the Red Sea. How wonderful, how great was his power. Now they were ready to stone Moses. You done deceived us and brought us out here to die in the wilderness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down before the people and take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod, whereas thou smotest the river. Take thy hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee, there upon the rock in and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the people. Now then, you take the rod and the elders, and you go up to this rock, and you smite it. But Moses was capable of doing it one of these things. The friend that first didn't want to get out The Lord didn't tell him to go work in under a shade in the tent. And I'll bring water out of the rock in the situation. He said, you go up to the rock. Paul mentions this rock in the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians. When he talks about it and said they drink of that spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. Christ is our deliverance. But that rock was their deliverance from death. Because he produced the water hanging on the door. That was their source of deliverance. So I think wherever God delivers us, it becomes uh, a type and a type of Christ. It wasn't literally Christ himself standing there, but it was a type and shadow of him. Whenever God provides deliverance, I think. Now then, and call the rock of the place. The name of the place, and I can't pronounce those names. Because of the chiding of the children, children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us? Or not? They tempted the Lord by saying, Is God with us? Lord, you have deserted us. This is important. We need to believe God will do what He promised us. Now, people enjoy coming to church and feeling the Spirit and getting the plum happy. Shout. 
but for the most of your time, you're going to be out there and you don't feel a thing in the world moving on you. All you've got to sustain you is your faith. And we need to believe God when we get up Monday morning and we're tired and we got a headache. And we need to believe God the way we did Sunday night when we went to church and said, praise the Lord, when we had the triumph of the shout. Very little of your life will be spent shouting. Amen. The most of your life is going to be spent going about your daily job. Dave's got to go over to the fire and he's got to go do the things I don't want to do. Go over and climb around those buildings and then the burning and listen to those people laugh at him. As long as he's here, he's going to have that to contend with. But there's coming the day that the Lord has promised Dave something. That if he will leave here with his sins of the blood, he's promised a home in heaven. I feel symbolically the promise of Canaan is like our promise of heaven. Myself. And you know, even uh, a lot of the, you know the song, the Canaan land I'm on my way. We ain't never going to Canaan more than likely, but we're talking about heaven. I'm on my way for the soul will never die. Now then, saying is the Lord will smile. Then came Amalekai, Amalek, and fought with Israel in this thing. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out of men, and go out and fight with them tonight. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of the Lord in my hand. Now here we're getting to the point God didn't fail. God always was there. But Moses didn't have the strength to carry the job. You don't wait. You don't. Moses now needs to carry it. Moses couldn't hold his hand and tell him what happened when I failed. Why? Why do you think the enemy began to win? And here is the thing. If you want a church built, it requires more than this pastor. He can please God. He can be saved. But there will be times that there must be people in the church who hold the They have to. Whatever they do, you know, Dave gets up there leading the song. He's sitting back there watching the, the movie on the camera and, and, and playing a game. It will greatly limit what he can do because we are members one of the other. And just a nice <coughs> you can take this thumb and shut it up the car door and set up tonight your whole body in misery because your thumbs hurt. Yeah. This thing. We are members one of another and we must work together to perform this job fully that God wants done. If we sit back and don't do our job, we actually place a load on the other members of the church that should be burdened, that should be there. I got a grandson, a step grandson, that when he was three months old, he had a stroke. He kind of crippled him in the right leg and the right arm. He has to do it all with the left arm. Well, you can see him hobble along. He tries to straighten up the walk, but there's a weakness there. The right side is not doing this job. This is the same thing in church. If part of the church doesn't do the job, this will produce a weakness in the church. If they think nobody else in your church. Now then, Joshua did as Moses had said to him. And fought with them on life. And Moses, Aaron, and Herod went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And 
when he let down his hands and the like, Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat there upon there. And Aaron and Herod stood upon his and stood up, and stayed up his hands, one on the one side and then the other on the other side. And the hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomforted the, the Amorites and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it the years of Joshua. While others put out the remembrance of Amorite from under heaven, and Moses filled an altar and called the name of him. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have the war with Amorite from generation to generation. Remember Saul and David? God told Saul, Go down to Amorites. So Saul goes down there, and what Saul does. He changes God's commandment. He sought to improve upon God. <clears throat> we always mess up when we do that. And if we ain't careful, we will do it. The Lord said, Do it this way. Yes, Lord, I'm going to go. Lord, you didn't quite know what to do here. I, I, I mean, uh, you didn't fully understand the situation. So Saul went down there and he kept the priest the best and he even brought back the king. If I know or think you don't understand something, Samuel Bailey, the prophet of God. Could you ask him about it? Saul said, Yeah, I'll give you that. Yeah, I'll give you that. Samuel said, What I hear the cattle and the sheep. Oh, how is it? I hear these animals. Amen. Oh, well, I brought back the best to sacrifice to God. I changed God's commandment to please me. Mm -hmm. Basically, because of what you've done, God will take the kingdom of Israel and come in and give it to God. Because He took it upon himself to rewrite the commandment. Does that sound like the people You know what's the day you're saying? We must guard daily that we don't do that. That we don't take God's commandment and change it and find an excuse to not do it. Remember what they do. Pharisees come to Jesus and they said, Why is it thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders by eating without washing their hands? What the Lord says to them is, Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? He said, For God said, Thou shalt honor thy father and mother. But you say, if you tell your father, I, this is the given uh, I looked this up, they claim that Corbin is the claim that was telling them, this is, I'm going to give to the temple. So then you can let your dad start. Uh, you're saying, uh, so by their traditions, they nullified the commandment of God. They changed it. I can keep the money now. I don't have to help him. I'm not wrong or wrong. So by their tradition, this is what Saul does. He took the commandment of God and said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Oh, man, that's a pretty much a casual sheep. I, I, I'll just take them, the best. Take the rush stuff or whatever. But take the best. He looked to his own wealth. And in doing so, he disobeyed God. And God says, no, that won't work. I'm taking it all away from you. Now, as we go along like this, we get into these things. 
son. And Jethro, the priest of Medan, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now here's the thing about this wasn't hid under a rock. What God was doing for Israel was known throughout the region. In other words, how could you take two million people with a pick the lesser number and their cattle and run through a blistering desert with no water and feed them and water them daily? When they invaded Iraq, this is Fort Brandon, was in the seventh wave of tanks when he was. He told me he got up to 150 degrees over there. He was allotted a certain amount of water a day because Uncle Sam had a hard time getting water for the army. I think he was about 150, about 500,000 men over there. I'm not sure. But with all our modern conveniences, they had to put each soldier on a, soldier on a allowance of water. And I forgot how much she has allowed, but it was less than a gallon of water a day. But now it's very hot. You sweat, you lose a lot of water through the perspiration. So, our mind, we had a hard time feeding and providing water for 500,000 men. But God daily fed. Three men and men, women, and children, and old folks, and their animals. Three meals a day, or two meals, whatever it was supposed to be in. And let them walk in about up through that desert. Provided the shade from the sun of their day, and a cloud for the light for the night. So there's no way this could escape. So Moses' father in law, Jethro, he was a priest. Now, I don't know how he fit in with God. I mean, the Gentile's father-in-law took Moses' wife and after he sent her back and her two sons, which the names of one was and the other was, and they said, I've been alien in the same land, strange land, and the name of the other was Elizra, for God for the God of my father said he was my help and delivered me up from me. Sword of Pharaoh. Now they they named their children in a way their names had to be quite awful. So Moses had two children. Apparently, I don't know. Apparently, Moses' father-in-law was an Ethiopian. At least Moses' wife was an Ethiopian. I don't know, and I've never seen where he had more than one wife. So, and this is where, when they got Aaron and Mary, Moses' brother and sister, whom God had greatly moved on, they got unhappy because Moses had an Ethiopian wife. And they kind of began to put her down. And they just put his so, regardless of who people live, we keep a good spirit. Social security? Uh, I personally don't think it's such a great idea on interracial marriage. Uh, my daughter was married to an Asian for a while. But in regards to that, regardless of the church, you keep a good spirit toward other people. Because they are human. All people, Christ died for on the cross. Here are these people. Yeah, don't ask me how to do it, I can only do it. But that being said, and Jethro, Moses' father, came with his sons and swapped them to Moses and to the world before he came to the Mount of God. And he said unto Moses, I let father law, Jethro, and come down to and thy wife and her two sons with her. And Moses went <coughs> up to meet his father-in-law and did obedience. 
Jesus kissed him and they said to each other, well, they asked each other of their welfare and they came into the tent. They was glad to see each other. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake and all the travelers that had come upon them by the way and how the Lord delivered them. Yet you will rejoice for all the goodness which the Lord has done to Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hands of the Egyptians. The man was happy. Now, he had a good attitude. Unfortunately, you and I face many people that your Christianity does not believe because sin does not love righteousness. So, when you show them a righteous viewpoint, uh, they don't want it. They just don't, ain't comfortable. Some people won't say much, but the majority of sinners are not too comfortable in your presence when your life condemns them. If you live exactly like them, they're perfectly But if you live a godly life in separation, if you don't drink with them, you don't use the filthy language with them, you don't do the double meaning jokes with them, you don't indulge with them in sinful entertainment, as far as they're concerned, you can go down the road. They just don't put it. Even though I was only 16 when I got saved, I had a bunch of friends. You know, but by that time, I was getting down to one place at night and staying out all night and stuff like that. And my dad was in Michigan. And all people that go to football events, I was saying that. My parents, grandparents, didn't bother me too much. And um, then they had a couple of weeks. So the thing was, I got saved. All of a sudden, I didn't have no friends. I can say they were sort of big guy. It's gone for all of you. Because I no longer was fun for them to be around me at the time. I no longer was doing the things that we've done before. And it I was bored. And I think you'll find that your life now but when they get in trouble when they really when, when something is very bad now your your cousin might be mad at you Terry but he his son has a car wreck and I'm calling you midnight Terry won't you pray <laughs> if you live right they see it and that's when you can help Moses told his father, okay. and Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness, and Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who hath delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians, and out of the hands of Pharaoh, who hath delivered your people from under the hand of the Egyptians. <coughs> now I know that the Lord is greater than all powers. Now, today, they say there is no God. But in those days, they had many gods. And this is something that we've had a problem with running across in Christianity. They had regional gods. They had a God here. And remember the <coughs> scenario on the the singer is carried away in captivity and they brought other people in, people in to replace them. They sent over to the Israelites and said, Come and show us how to get along with this God. In other words, they recognized that there was a God there. He wasn't their God. They never did really serve him. They just kind of respected him. Now, come show us how to get on this God. In the early days of the Christian church, some of the pagan principles began to creep in on the people. 
Five minutes box one. And you're the angel. That's why we have patron saints. What would I be doing? Because they have changed the saint. If God or goddess of the cause, they give them a name of the saint. You have St. Christopher. And you can go to choir with me and expect to go to travel with you. You have St. Jude, the patron of lost causes. Uh, you have St. Patrick. See, in some cases, Patrick may be a good man. He may have, I don't know nothing about him. He might have been a wonderful fellow. But they have made him the patron of her. See, the thing is, patron, St. Patrick is dead and sleeps beneath the sun. In Ireland, he knows nothing about those. Smartphones are addictive. And pray to him is a holiday. Yeah. Got I used to have a little book, but I lost it. Written by a Baptist preacher out of Texas, he called it Mary Idolatry. What she brought down how to pray to these saints and to Mary, how it was idolatry. And it is. Well, our people, a lot of them try this. And some of our born again people seem to think it's okay. And I, I, I really don't think we should have anything to do with something like that. Saint Saint Florian, Florian, Brother, Brother Johnson, St. Florian is the patron saint for firefighters. And one of the guys came up and gave me a pin. said St. Florian on the cross. And I told him I didn't want that on my uniform. He got mad at me. Okay. I don't believe in that. I don't either because the woman or whoever that was, may have been a good person but they died and they in the grave and they don't know nothing about what you're saying and any prayer to them is idolatry say in the rosary is idolatry hail mary mother of god blessed our kind of woman pray for us now i said us now she was a great, wonderful, holy woman. She's not a person. There is only one mediator between man and God, the man of Christ Jesus. If you want victory with God, please let us know. He comes from prayer and fasting. St. Florian, a man. Florida? Florian. F L O R A E N. Florian. St. Florian. I've heard of him. Hi, buddy. Oh, my God. How's your trip sound? I knew them all. Feel good. I knew them Lutheran people would come back and do this. Lutheran, let's see. Methodist. Lutheran. 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 Good morning. 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 Good well, good for them. Good for you. Good morning. 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 How we doing, Allie? I'm good. 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 I'm
when I started. Where should I record it? I'm thinking that is. That's when I started at uh, my hey buddy. Good morning, Ty. Yeah. I haven't missed you yet. I haven't got to say all three days sometimes. I'll get um, your buddy down there, kid. Why? They got the motorcycle wreck. Uh, these come back. Uh, they're doing okay. Uh, they came in and see us last week. What's his name? Roscoe. Is it no, Roscoe? that was Alvin. Alvin. I don't know if you remember him. He's just a kid. He's down there. Is that And Norman was the one who drove the emergency escape helicopter for the president. He was over there. He came in there. They're moving like the Adjutant down there. He's going to Does Billy still preach there in the mornings? No. He hasn't been there in the last two years. He's had a revival. Yeah. And the Hi, Hi, you you are, this is Walt. <laughs> <Josh, laughs> <laughs> 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 your This is Pastor White. How are you? <laughs> yeah, he's in there. I'll be with Josh. Okay. Hey, Josh, what is Billy's well, revival? Josh, no. 